I'm Kim Perlack. I'm the current chair of the guitar department here at Berkeley College of Music, and it's my honor to welcome you to this concert honoring the legacy of Mick Goodrick. Hi, Mick. Mick is watching us from home, so it's great, great that you're there. <laughs> so this concert came about years ago, of course, with everything that you'll learn about Mick, that you'll remember about him, that you're thinking about. Now that you're here, you'll know why we all have wanted to do this for such a long time. And finally, it, we realized, look, Ber Berkeley and Mick are going to turn 75 years old in the same year. And it turned out, of course, that year was the year we all had to leave for a little bit because of the pandemic. And so before that, Mick and I got to sit down and, and dream up, you know, okay, what would you like to have? Like, who would you like to have in a concert that would represent the things you, you've brought to the school? And he picked these wonderful musicians that you'll hear tonight, everyone who's submitted a video, and all the people who are playing. And I think what's really beautiful about this group of people is that there are thousands of you and hundreds of you who love Mick, and we're honoring all of you by honoring them because Mick gave us this curriculum at Berkeley that he developed in a book that thousands of guitarists have used every day for decades and decades called The Advancing Guitarist. And when he came back to Berkeley for his second run on our faculty, he was with Larry Bayonne and Rick Peckham, our chairs at the time, and developed the curriculum based in that spirit that allows all of us to learn our instrument with depth in a lifelong process that allows us to be ourselves. Mick didn't want people to copy him. Our big joke this week was that this is a person who did not want to be on a poster, and then every time we had posters made for the concert, somehow the order was mixed up and the posters got bigger and bigger until they were definitely taller than me. And so I thought, that's fitting, right? that we are carrying on this big legacy, and you do it by being you. So remember that when you're on your instrument, you're honoring your teacher by becoming yourself. And these incredible, thank you, yes. And thank you, Mick, for that. And so you'll hear a lot of beautiful, heartfelt music from people who really love Mick, who he loves, and who we're just honored to share this with. So many of our alumni went on to teach here, and you'll see that reflected. We have alumni, we have honorary doctorates, we have people who are formerly on our faculty and people who are currently serving on our faculty. So for us, this week has been an old home week. It's been a big get together, and all of you who are out there who have your own love and memories of some of us and some of the folks who are joining us and of Mick, we want you to know we've been thinking of you and holding you close to us this week, and so we hope that you feel that. Um, so I'd like to say that um, you'll see art tonight because Mick is a painter and a visual artist, and he would gather all of us who did that. We would have a lunch bunch and talk about art. And um, For those of you who are recent alumni, I want you to know I drew the horse this morning. And some people are laughing because this is a great exercise to get your right brain going and get out of your head and, and play music. And then some of you are also remembering the other side of, of, a, of a teacher who was very old school about whether or not you actually practiced all the data on your fretboard. And those things go hand in hand, of course. So it's always my honor every semester to welcome all the new students coming and everyone coming back. And so I'll close by saying to all of you tonight, welcome to the guitar department. I'm Kim Perlack. I'm the current chair of the guitar department here at Berkeley College of Music. And it's my honor to welcome you to this concert honoring the legacy of Mick Goodrick. Hi, Mick. Mick is watching us from home. So it's great, great that you're there. <laughs> so this concert came about years ago, of course, 
with everything that you'll learn about Mick, that you'll remember about him, that you're thinking about. Now that you're here, you'll know why we all have wanted to do this for such a long time. And finally, it, we realized, look, Ber Berkeley and Mick are going to turn 75 years old in the same year. And it turned out, of course, that year was the year we all had to leave for a little bit because of the pandemic. And so before that, Mick and I got to sit down and, and dream up, you know, okay, what would you like to have? Like, who would you like to have in a concert that would represent the things you, you've brought to the school? And he picked these wonderful musicians that you'll hear tonight. Everyone who's submitted a video, all the people who are playing. And I think what's really beautiful about this group of people is that there are thousands of you and hundreds of you who love Mick. And we're honoring all of you by honoring them because Mick gave us this curriculum at Berkeley that he developed in a book that thousands of guitarists have used every day for decades and decades called The Advancing Guitarist. And when he came back to Berkeley for his second run on our faculty, he was with Larry Bayonne and Rick Peckham, our chairs at the time, and developed a curriculum based in that spirit that allows all of us to learn our instrument with depth in a lifelong process that allows us to be ourselves. Mick didn't want people to copy him. Our big joke this week was that this is a person who did not want to be on a poster, and then every time we had posters made for the concert, somehow the order was mixed up and the posters got bigger and bigger until they were definitely taller than me. And so I thought, that's fitting, right? That we are carrying on this big legacy and you do it by being you. So remember that when you're on your instrument, you're honoring your teacher by becoming yourself. And these incredible, thank you, yes. And thank you, Mick, for that. And so you'll hear a lot of beautiful, heartfelt music from people who really love Mick, who he loves, and who we're just honored to share this with. So many of our alumni, went on to teach here, and you'll see that reflected. We have alumni, we have honorary doctorates, we have people who are formerly on our faculty and people who are currently serving on our faculty. So for us, this week has been an old home week. It's been a big get together, and all of you who are out there who have your own love and memories of some of us and some of the folks who are joining us and of Mick, we want you to know we've been thinking of you and holding you close to us this week, and so we hope that you feel that. Um, so I'd like to say that um, you'll see art tonight because Mick is a painter and a visual artist, and he would gather all of us who did that. We would have a lunch bunch and talk about art. And um, for those of you who are recent alumni, I want you to know I drew the horse this morning. And some people are laughing because this is a great exercise to get your right brain going and get out of your head and, and play music. And then some of you are also remembering the other side of, of, a, of a teacher who was very old school about whether or not you actually practiced all the data on your fretboard. And those things go hand in hand, of course. So it's always my honor every semester to welcome all the new students coming and everyone coming back. And so I'll close by saying to all of you tonight, welcome to the guitar department. Hi, Mick. When I was told about this event in your honor, I started thinking about when I first crossed paths with you and uh, also did the math. And it actually was uh, almost exactly 50 years ago when I made my move from New York to Boston to begin teaching at Berkeley in 1971. During my first Berkeley semester, a student came up to me and asked if uh, I would be interested in getting together with some of the other Berkeley people to play some evening. And I was new in town, didn't know anyone, so I said, yeah, sure. And eventually I found the ensemble room and there I found you and bassist George Moraz, who was visiting from New York and the student who brought us together and that was drummer Harry Blazer. 
At that time, you were several years into your first teaching stint at Berkeley. So you and I were the only faculty members. And that evening revealed a lot of things to me. First of all, uh, living in New York, I was used to touring with New York-based musicians and not knowing anyone in Boston. I wondered if I was, would continue using New York players. However, the quality of the playing at my first informal Berkeley Jam session let me know that number one, I could find excellent players in Boston, and number two, I knew this guitar player was a real find. And soon, the new Gary Burton Quartet with Mick Goodrick was up and running, touring and recording. Now, things I remember about Mick. Mick was a revelation as a guitar player. I always knew guitar was one of those instruments that tended to encourage players to uh, rely on familiar fingering patterns that were comfortable on the fretboard. And that led to a lot of similar melodic patterns from uh, you know a lot of different guitar players. They often played licks that sounded the same. But Mick wasn't a slave to repetitious patterns at all. He always came up with new voicings and new melodic constructions. I don't think he ever played a solo that wasn't fresh and unique. What else do I remember about Mick? Well, of course, he was a natural teacher. When we toured back then, he was taking a break from teaching, but even in the band, he was constantly offering great advice. For one thing, he taught our bass player, Steve Swallow, how to play his electric bass with a pick, even though Mick, ironically, was uh, using the pick less and less himself in those days. Uh, and after 19-year-old Pat Metheny joined the band, which gave us a two-guitar group, Mick provided nonstop advice to help Pat develop into the Pat Metheny we all know today. I also remember a few personal things about Mick. He usually traveled very light when we toured. On one lengthy European tour, he showed up for departure with only a shoulder bag and his guitar. But along with the bare essentials that were in that bag, he also brought along a set of watercolor paints, which then became his hobby on that tour. In short, Mick was always doing something interesting and he was a delight to engage in conversation. Well, we toured for four years, made some good records together, and we saw a lot of the world. But at some point, Mick told me he missed teaching and had decided to resume that part of his musical life. Of course, he went on to become one of the most highly respected teachers in the jazz world, and Berkeley has been very fortunate to have him on the faculty all these years. Mick, I am here tonight to tell you how much so many of your fellow musicians learned from you and benefited from your talents as a player and a teacher. I thank you for your lifetime of contributions to the betterment of music. That's a quest we are all pursuing. It was inspiring to share that part of my adventure with you. Best wishes. Hi, I'm John Schofield. And in 1970, I went to Berkeley at age 18, and Mick Goodrick was the number one jazz guitarist in town. And hearing him live was such an experience. I'd never heard anything like it. Uh, he was on the cutting edge of jazz guitar, and that was still really evolving at the time. And Mick had a truly modern style, and he played the music of the past, but differently with uh, really modern things that had happened in jazz, he included in his style and it was very comprehensive. And I had never heard anything like it. Uh, and it was uh, really something to live in a town where you heard somebody who played like that up close. And then I took a few lessons from him and got to really hear what he was doing and his control and his finesse on the guitar, his ability to play and his Epiphone Sheraton, his beautiful sound. I witnessed 
mixed ascendancy in jazz when he started playing with Gary Burton Quartet, especially, which uh, I got to witness that firsthand and hear them often. And uh, hear a mick with Jack DeJeanette directions too, another group he joined. And uh, Mick and John Abercrombie took legato playing, the Jim Hall kind of way, but he took it to a new level with his uh, ability. And uh, he influenced all of us that heard him and got to meet him and study with him. I got to play with Mick in those days and after in the 80s and uh, that was always a wonderful experience uh, to, to make music with him and to hear him up close. I loved his ECM record, In Passing, which still stands the test of time. It's a great, great jazz record. And I hope people know uh, how really important Mick has been in the development of jazz guitar and uh, how he inspired so many of us and continues to do so. I got it together, the money and the uh, initiative to get a lesson from him at some point in Boston. I remember he was living in a little garden apartment somewhere. I remember lots of green and you go in at the, in, you know, through this little forest and there are all these glass windows. And I remember we, he asked me to play something for him and the only standard I knew then and, do I even know it now? No, I don't know it anymore. But I knew it then, all the things you are. I tried to get through a chorus, but I was too embarrassed and, and uh, insecure to, to continue. So I stopped, just shaking my head, and he, he said, uh, you know, I was really enjoying that, and you stopped. You know? So already I was kind of an un, on an unsure footing with the guy. Um, I, when I left, I told him I was going to call him to schedule a lesson the following week. As it turned out, I didn't have the money to call him again for another year. And uh, when I did call him, I said, hi, Mr. Goodrick, it's Wayne Krantz. I don't know if you remember me. Um, uh, I took a lesson a while ago, wondering if I could schedule another one. And he paused and he said, didn't you say you were going to call me the following week during that first lesson? I said, yeah, I, I did, but you know, I didn't have the money, so I didn't want to waste your time. He paused again he said, Tell you what, call me back in another year. Uh, so I did, ultimately, and I got some lessons from him, which I'm grateful for. Um, his book, Advancing Guitarist, was, was a big deal. It was the first guitar book I'd ever seen that was closer to the way that I was thinking and feeling about playing. And, um, and the creativity of it, uh, the, the sort of non-dogmatic approach that he suggested uh, immediately uh, took hold. And um, sometime, years, years later, I wrote a book myself, and uh, he, he ordered a bunch of copies of it for his students. And, uh, and I was so flattered by that. You know, and I was thinking if, if I can, if I've written the second best guitar book ever, I'm satisfied. <laughs> um, he always, Nick would always come to my clinics that I gave, would get occasionally at Berkeley years after, um, which always surprised me and, and kind of confused me because I was certain there was nothing that I knew that he didn't. Um, but it meant a lot that he, that he would come. Um, he, the first question he would always ask me when I, when I saw him over the, over the years was, you working? And uh, <laughs> I never, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm always working. I'm not always getting paid, but, you know, I'm always doing something. And so I always say, yeah, but I, I, it, it always kind of seemed like an old school question to me working you know like the like what the I don't know the saxophone section of the Count Basie band would say to each other when they ran into each other at the coffee shop um, he also always told me a joke when when we would run into each other 
I remember the last time he and Dave and I had uh, lunch somewhere and he told a long joke that I won't tell because I, I can't, it's too involved and I'm not talented enough at that to, to do so. But the punchline was, yeah, Wayne Krantz. Um, he taught me a lot, Nick. I mean, he taught a lot of people a lot. He always, just in the way I thought about East Coast guitar, modern guitar, he, he was always kind of the, the centerpiece of that. It seemed like everybody else just kind of spiraled out from that center. And uh, generations of people. And, you know, the, the, the improvisational quality of his playing was inspiring. It seemed that he was improvising melodies when he played. And not everybody does that. Tons and tons of fantastic players don't do that. He does, and it inspired me in part to do it too. I value that. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the centers of my playing. That comes from him. And, um, uh, the last thing I want to say is just, he was always accepting of me. You know, I, I never, uh, I know I was never a star student, but he would kind of talk about me in the same breath as he would talk about his star students. And, and, uh, and that was kind of a vote of confidence that, that I found tremendously uh, strengthening. So thanks for that, Nick, and for everything. And, yeah, the only Sir Mick I know is Sir Mick Goodwin. Hi, my name is Larry Bayonne. I'm a, a chair, <laughs> chair emeritus of the guitar department. As you can see how important Mick, hi Mick, Mick is to us as a uh, guitarists, jazz guitarists, and musicians. I first met Mick in 1967. I was 17 years old. I came to Berkeley, and uh, we had guitar labs, right? And, and I heard about a guitar lab with this teacher named Mick Goodrick. You should uh, check him out. So I went to the guitar lab, and I was astounded. I didn't know anything that he was talking about. He was uh, um, introspective about the modes and, you know, let's play and, and uh, here's, uh, here's a progression you can use. And it was, it was all new to me and uh, I never heard anything like that. The first time I heard Mick play on stage was with the great saxophone player, Charlie Mariano. He had a group, and um, I, st I couldn't believe the things that Mick was doing. You know, when I used to go and hear him play, I heard him play in many duos with Randy Roos and uh, oh, Pat Metheny, and um, I never understood exactly what he was doing with his chords, but it was so beautiful that he was doing. He was a great accompanist. I heard him play with um, um, Dominique Eade and uh, um, um, Dan Greenspan and Mili Bermejo. All uh, wonderful playing and wonderful comping behind his chords. Um, were always so perfect, and his solos restrained and melodic and going to places that I never heard go anywhere else, anything like that. Um, in 1988, Gary Burton at the time was uh, the dean of curriculum here, and he put together a concert of all of uh, four jazz guitarists that were alumni from Berkeley. It was John Schofield, John Abercrombie, Mick's good friend, Emily Remler, and Mick. 
and it was it was just an um, amazing concert. But I could tell everyone was looking at Mick all the time to see, you know, he was like the musical director. He was he was the person that they were all looking for for direction and all. And he played great. They all played great. There's a funny story about this. Um, their, their last tune was Stella by Starlight, and they took it completely out. And uh, this is a story that Jim Kelly told me. Um, no one knew where anyone was, we thought, so Jim went to Mick after the concert, a while after, and said, Mick, were you lost during that your solo? And Mick looked at him with his humor and said, you know, at first, I didn't know, and then I knew. <laughs> and that's how, and you know, I, I've been looking at some um, uh, videos of Mick playing lately, and we talk about his chords, you know, but in his soloing, his, uh, his rhythmic uh, expertise was so apparent, uh, playing over the bar line, playing different accents. It's just amazing all the things that he did. Uh, when uh, Rick Peckham and I asked him to come back to Berkeley and teach, and he said, yes, we were ecstatic. And we, um, part of his schedule here at Berkeley was also to teach any, um, faculty members that wanted to take lessons from him uh, as faculty development. Um, I had studied with Mick in my uh, time as an undergraduate here at Berkeley. I studied with him as, uh, in my graduate studies at New England Conservatory, and I studied with him at that time. And he always was very supportive. He helped me with my getting me ready for my trio, uh, CD and all, and um, we miss him. We miss him. We miss him. His, his humor, his um, his uh, sage advice, and um, just his uh, his musicality was part of his personality and all. And Mick, we love you and thank you very much. Hi, this is Mike Stern. And I just wanted to say a few words about an amazing musician and a really wonderful person, Mick Goodrick, who I got a chance to study with. I wish I had more opportunities to do that, but I had some uh, lessons with him years ago and in some a couple of different contexts uh, as uh, just private students and then, uh, you know, private lesson. And then uh, in 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 kind of with the, with a few other guitar players, and um, they were really special, really special lessons. Uh, and uh, you know, Mick has been such a an incredible influence on so many guitar players that I know, and I'm definitely one of them. I I uh, am uh, just amazed by his incredible playing and uh, over the years in different contexts. Uh, I heard him with Gary Burton, uh, with uh, when him and Pat Metheny were in the band together, and it was just extraordinary, Mick, Mick's playing. I mean, everybody's playing in the band, of course, was amazing, but I was just totally knocked out by Mick's, um, just seemed so honest, his, his improvisation, and so fresh. Uh, and uh, and anyway, uh, and as a person too, he was really special to me. Uh, he, um, you know, one time I remember uh, being really down. I went to a lesson with him, and I just I couldn't hold back. I was almost crying. I think I probably was crying. I was just feeling like I can't play. I'm never going to get this stuff together. I want to go home. I want to quit. And Mick just you know, pulled me out of that uh, by just uh, relating to that totally. He said the same kind of thing happened to him. He was going to call his mom. As I remember, he said he's going to call his mom and say, look, I can't do this. I'm going to 
I want to quit and uh, come pick me up. And, you know, I guess he was going to Berkeley at the time. And uh, if, if memory serves me correctly, which it doesn't always, but it was something like that. He, and, uh, and, you know, he was a student at the time. And, and, uh, and then he said, well, he had to find something else, you know, in terms of uh, how he approached improvisation and approached the guitar and approached, approached music in general. Well, he certainly found something else. I mean, I don't know how he sounded before before he found something else. Probably still great, but wow! I mean, he is one of the most amazing musicians on any instrument for me that I've ever had the real good fortune to to uh, experience him and and to hear him and to, and to know him as a person. Of course, I, you know. All of the above are just just an amazing guy, an amazing, amazing musician. And in context with, uh, I heard him with uh, Jerry Briganzi, kind of more swinging kind of context, and he was extraordinary, just fresh, amazing way of uh, playing standards, of course. And, and heard him with Pat doing, uh, Matheny doing a duo one time, which just blew me away. And... Uh, a couple of times with Randy Roos, uh, just an amazing player. One time I was in Chile and I heard him uh, on TV. I was, uh, you know, I, I had my back to the TV and I heard an amazing guitar player and I just turned, it sounded like somebody was reading some classical stuff. I turned around and it was Mick and he was playing three lines at once improvising. I mean, I was just, no one else could do that. As far as I, you know, I've never heard him. <laughs> and, and Mick was just playing, it was just amazing. And it was with Charlie Hayden's uh, Liberation Orchestra. And they, uh, Charlie, uh, apparently, I guess he was featuring Mick every night at a certain time because the whole band was quiet and Mick was playing and just improvising. Wow. It was like, an, you know, one of these things, sometimes they play jazz real late at night in certain countries, you know. And I was in Chile doing some gigs, and I heard that on TV. It just blew me away. But I wasn't surprised when I saw who it was. It was Mick, you know. So um, anyway, I could go on forever, but uh, just want to say it's been a just a, a, a joy, and I feel very blessed to, to uh, have Mick... Goodrick uh, be in my life, and he will be forever. He just, he, you know, all the stuff that I still try to study that he has put together. Amazing, amazing teacher, and uh, and all the stuff he's played. Amazing writer, an amazing player. So, uh, and I'm still trying to learn all that stuff, and will be forever. Thank you. All right, it's on.
starting out. What are your memories of that experience? That's a good place to start. Oh, I think. man. I mean, well, first of all, Mick was and is one of the greatest musicians probably either one of us had ever known. That's we played that we played with, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so for me to kind of, first of all, be not only invited to be in that band, but welcomed by all you guys, and Mick in particular, since he had the chair and everything. I mean, I, I often say it, and it's really true. It's sort of like I became like the fifth member of the Beatles because that, because that band was that for me, you know, with Moses, Bob Moses playing drums and Swallow and you and Mick. So, you know, it was incredible just to be there. But in addition to that, Mick and I developed a very strong relationship of, you know, playing duo gigs. I think you came yeah. to actually hear us play duo before you made it official yeah. to make sure that we could play good together and everything. Well, it was a, it was a question. Yeah. Uh, I'd never thought of having two guitars in the band. And for a, for a jazz group at that point, that, that was kind of unheard of. So, uh, it, you know, it was... Had, took some thought and it had sort of, I said, what happens, you know, maybe we'll do this for a month or two and realize it isn't working or something, but it turns out it worked just great. It worked great and also, you know, the, the my time with you was kind of divided into two parts, which was the beginning year or so, which was with Mick, yeah. and then Mick moved on to, right, to do to his teaching thing. Again. And um, you know, then it continued back to being a quartet. Um, but Mick and I continued to play together yeah, often. I know. And um, you know, the, the relationship that Mick has had to the instrument itself is something very particular. I mean, he's not only a hero to me, he's a hero to probably, you know, it's gotta be in the thousands of people that studied with him, that have read his books, that followed his voice yeah. leading thing, that bought his records. Um, and, you know, man, for me, it's just like having known Mick and having yeah. had the experience of playing with you guys is one of the most enriching things in my life. So here we are to give tribute to Mick. Yeah. And uh, we both wish we could be there. I, we're in Florida now. Yeah, I, you can maybe tell. Yeah, I just finished playing a gig, and Gary came to hear us. He still makes me nervous after oh. all the time. But, it, you know, I did my best to get all of the common tones to line up from chord to chord. Yeah, no, I, I, I heard everything sounded good. I good. didn't hear any problem. Good, that's good to hear. But, Mick, we love you, man. We do. And, uh, you know, wish we could be there with you. Congratulations for all the great times. Yeah.
This has been an incredible night of guitar playing. By the way, my name is Cheryl Bailey. I'm the assistant chair of the guitar department. <laughs> so I know everybody's head and hearts are filled with amazing music, so I just want to close out with a few things about Mick that I can tell you about. We are all his students, and we will be his students into the future. And for me, this is the book that has been mentioned many times tonight. So... I want to share with you some of my favorite lessons. The thing that's amazing about this book is that you could start from the beginning and go to the back. You could start in the back and go to the beginning. You could start in the middle and go wherever you want. To me, I always use this a book as a book of musical divination. I would say, universe, what do I need to be hip to today? And there you go. And that's what is amazing. I don't know anything like this. So if you don't have this, you must have that and you will have this. So here are a few things that really stuck out to me that in my life I come back to over and over again. Um, actually, this is sort of my favorite part of the book are some little rants that he has. Playing beyond yourself. When you play great for other people, especially when it's with other musicians, it's a gift for everyone, which we definitely experienced tonight. Be thankful. Realize not so much that you did it, but rather that it must have been needed at the time, or at least possible at the time. When you don't like the way you're playing, try to change your attitude instead of changing the content, or try to like what you play instead of playing what you like. To the extent that you can change your attitude, the content will take care of the rest. Music is like life on a small scale. Life is like music on a large scale. Two kinds of playing. Playing on one chord. This is my favorite. I come back to this all the time. Two kinds of playing. Playing on one chord, which is modal playing. Playing through a progression of chords. The first kind of playing is like making a curve go through a straight line. The second kind is making a straight line go through a curve. Think about that one. <laughs> yeah. We have two more here. There's so many. I'm just touching the surface, but I know. Oh, the one thing that everybody has in common is pain. See if you can learn to play from your pain. Even if you don't think you're successful at it or that it's doing any good, it may all come together for you one day. If that happens, even just one time, you'll find out that the preparation was more than worth the effort because you might experience something that could change your understanding of music, people, and life in a very fundamental way. The last one I want to share with you Patience is so important. We can't help the fact that we usually want everything right now. However, experience usually teaches us at least not to expect it. Things unfold at their own pace. They take time. Just hang in there. Do what you see needs to be done. Work on what you see needs work. Make it as interesting as you can for yourself. Who cares how long it takes, really? Don't look for results. If you work on what needs work, results will take care of themselves. Let them surprise you, yes. Music is infinitely perfectible. It just takes a lot of work, a lot of time, and as much love as you can find. So with love, gratitude, and respect, Mick, we love you. And I'd like to bring out my other colleagues and leaders of the guitar department.